In my mind, he was dead. He had died on the floor. I could feel it myself getting all uptight, thinking something is really not good now. I was just hysterical. I was just screaming, hysterical. I was trying not to think about it, about what had happened at the school. We'd been doing gardening the previous day and we wanted to kind of finish off. We were chopping a tree down at the front, so we were planning to do a day in the garden. And he was out running, he's very fit, he looks after his health, he's, you know, got a great diet. He said, right, I'm off for my usual 10k run. And he said, I'm going to do my run the other way around that I normally do. To see Joss, his brother, to catch him at his dad's where he usually calls him. I was trying to talk him out of going for his run um, because we were off. And he said, no, no, I'll get it done and I'll be back. I wouldn't have been going to my dad's apart from our washing machine breaking down. Then Andrew arrives, we're having a bit of a chat, and as I'm loading the washing machine, he says, um, I feel dizzy. Within a split second, it, it sat down on the floor and lay flat on the floor. And that's when the whole saga began. Basically, all I've got to fall back on was the training that I'd um, received. I keep my hand near his face so I can feel his breath. As soon as the breath stopped, that was it then. Chest compressions. Didn't bother looking for a pulse. Just turned him over onto his back. And I started to um, give him 30 chest compressions. And I did that four times. Same sequence. Back and forth. At the same time I'm doing that, I'm talking to my dad. I said, Dad, all you need to say to the man on the phone is, we've got a cardiac arrest. We've started CPR. The ambulance crew arrive. So we have another influx of helpers. So the man with the defib becomes in charge. So he says, Josh, you need to go, you need to move. So as he's talking to me, he's setting up the defibrillator. Everyone clear. He actually shocked Andrew with the, the defib. And he says, right, you need to carry on again. I'm doing the chest compressions. The paramedic is doing the ventilator while we're waiting for the defib to reanalyze it. As this is all carrying on, I'm, I'm just talk, talking to Andrew, saying, right, you're worrying me a bit. Now you need to shape yourself like. Fortunately, after the fourth shock, he starts his own breathing and he starts his own pulse again. No shock advised. Then we have the issue then of getting him out so we end up with a collapsible stretcher, which we have to build around him and slide underneath him. And then we basically wheel him out along the floor and uh, get him in the back of the ambulance. My mobile phone started ringing. He said, look, you, while Stanley was out running, something's happened. An ambulance has arrived and they've taken him to hospital. Well, I just fell to my knees, just thought, at, at that instant, I, I don't know what I thought, I just thought he'd been run over. The last thing I thought was that it would have been anything to do with a cardiac arrest or heart attack. It just didn't cross my mind at all. They'd induced him into a, a coma, so he was basically comfy. The hospital said, in two, we're going to wake him up in two days. If, if he comes round and he's normal and everything's OK, then we can deal with that. But we don't know the extent when this that kind of thing happens if there is any brain damage. Although he was very drugged up and very woozy, um, I could tell he was he was going to be himself, you know. So that was a huge relief. Pretty much my last memory of anything before the heart attack was leaving home and maybe two or three hundred yards up the up the road. And then uh, it happened. I don't actually remember what happened. All the nurses and whatnot were saying, are you the one? I said, well, yeah. 
Sam's, well, he's an inspiration to us all. He's, he's always been a miracle baby um, ever since his health problems as a young baby. When Sam was um, 10 days old, he was taken really poorly. I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd expected something to happen to him, but I hadn't expected it to be like this. It was, it was quite a nerv nervous morning, obviously. I was going for an interview for a head of PE job. All of the children, I said, right, line up in front of me, here we go. And all of a sudden, luckily, Sam was standing directly in front of me when I was talking to them, and he just went down. But it, there was something about it. I recognised this was not a normal fainting. I've seen children faint before. This didn't look anything like that. With four children, life's always quite hectic. Um, at the time, I had my youngest was only six months old, so... I was just like any other harried mum. I'd got my other children off to school and, and done my morning routine, housework and so forth. And I had my hand on his back so you, so I could feel it and I think, and his breathing started to get shallower and shallower. It was then that it finally hit me that Sam had had a cardiac arrest. So it was around midday and I received a phone call. Um, it was a school, Sam's school, um, calling to tell me that he'd been taken ill. Um, she didn't tell me in words what had happened, she just conveyed that I needed to get to the school as soon as possible. And that's when one of the other teachers there turned around and said, we have a defibrillator. It straight away says to step back and reading for a heart rate and detects and it takes a few seconds and then straight away it said no heart rate detected, um, shock the victim. I could hear sirens in the distance and I knew they were for Sam. Um, and then the air ambulance flew overhead and at that point um, it just really hit home, this is serious, you know, this is something really bad's happened. All I could do to block out the thoughts was just keep repeating a mantra over and over in my head, just please be alive when I get there. I just thought, please be alive. We shocked him three times and I was actually giving CPR when the ambulance service arrived and straight away I sort of looked at them and they said, no, you don't stop. Um, they started to administer adrenaline and all the other things and to make everything comfortable. Actually, why, why that was happening, it then said, step away. And it was one of the ambulance men who then pressed the button and straight afterwards it said, heart rate detected. I cannot in a million years find the words to explain the relief that I and I'm sure everyone else in the room felt. And I stayed at the hospital, obviously, and we took it in turns to sit by his side throughout the days and nights. Emma is my saviour. She saved my life, and I'll be forever grateful, you know. I don't think that there's any way that I could make out to her. I couldn't get any contact with him, um, and it was very difficult until later on that year, and Linda, his mum, had Put, put my name up for an award and it's the very first time I met him and I walked into the room and obviously I knew from memory and from pictures of him in the papers that that was him and I was absolutely overcome. Always, <laughs> that's always <laughs> the ultimate name. Defibrillators will be compulsory in schools yeah. if someone absolutely. We've always been very close, we've had that sibling rivalry over the years um, but we've always been pretty good friends, worked together helped each other in lots of different ways, but obviously now he's my hero, you know. I owe him everything. I owe him everything. I'm glad to see him every day. I'm sure he's glad to see me every day, so yeah. And he can see his kids and he can carry on doing all the things he thought he was going to carry on doing. I, I think everyone should have CPR training, but especially children because if you learn it when you're young, it's a lifelong skill that you never forget. I can't stress how important it is to have defibrillators where they can be easily accessed. I think a lot of people are afraid of doing something wrong, but if someone needs it, they're pretty desperate anyway, so all you're doing is helping. Defibrillators are really important to have, not just in schools, but everywhere, because you may not think it, but they do save lives. They save so many lives, and most people don't realise that until it's needed. There should be defibrillators in a, a, anywhere where anybody's got space to put one, to be quite honest. You can't make the patient any worse than what they are, so you can't do any harm. You just need somebody willing to try. And if you don't try, nothing will happen.
The challenge between ambulance response time and survival means that the longer the patient is left untreated, their chance of survival is reduced. What can you do? The facts about automated external defibrillators, AEDs or defibs for short, are misunderstood. You do not need to sign up for years of regular training. They don't cost thousands, but they do save lives. Defibs can be used on children. They can be used on pregnant women. Both the European and the UK Resuscitation Council guidelines refer to the chain of survival. Early recognition and call 999 for help. Early bystander CPR, early defibrillation and early advanced life support. But we can't complete the chain without your help. Your friends, family and colleagues could get themselves trained in how to perform CPR. Don't allow yourself to stand by and do nothing. You could be like Emma and Joss. You could be someone else's hero. You could make a difference. We want to get as many defibrillators out there as there are fire extinguishers. They save lives.